because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. Uh, On today's episode, I have the author of one of my favorite articles about economics and environment. It's called Why I Am Not an Environmentalist. I read it several years ago. I really, really liked it. But for some reason, I never reached out to the author or read his other work. I recently started reading his book, The Armchair Economist, and I found that fascinating as well. So I reached out to the author, Stephen Landsberg, and he was kind enough to agree to join me on Power Hour. So Stephen is, again, author of The Armchair Economist, very popular and influential book about economics, as well as a professor of economics at the University of Rochester. Stephen, welcome to Power Hour. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So uh, what brought about the book, The Armchair Economist? Why did you decide to write this book? Well, I wrote the first edition of The Armchair Economist uh, decades ago, and um, I happened to have fallen in at that time with a crowd of very brilliant people who knew a lot of economics, and we had lunch every day, and our lunches tended to go two or three hours. And we, was, this, was, that, was this at the University of Rochester? This was at the University of Rochester. We had a, a very active lunch group, and um, we uh, at lunch, everybody always had some new puzzle about the world, something that looked like it needed explaining, or, or some problem about the world that we felt like we needed to figure out how to solve. And um, those lunches were the highlight of my life. And I, I, I learned so much from them and they were so much fun. I wanted to share them with a wider audience. So a lot of armchair economist is, is what I learned at lunch. Yeah, that's one part I really like about the book. I mean, I always like when people uh, enjoy their work. So it's very, it's very nice to hear about that kind of fun. Do you still have those lunches? Uh, the lunches have have petered out for one reason or another. They closed the best restaurant on campus, and that was a big uh, uh, a big uh, uh, de- detriment for our for our lunches. It actually raised a very interesting economic issue because the administration claimed that they were closing this restaurant because it didn't make a profit, and uh, that's completely the wrong criterion when you're in a community where the restaurant is providing services to the community, people are going there for lunch, they're having wonderful conversations, uh, and that's the community you're trying to serve. You're trying to make the University of Rochester a more pleasant place. Even if you just look at your bottom line, it makes it easier to attract faculty. It means you don't have to pay them as much. Um, So um, I tried to convince the administration of this, and at one point, there was a faculty email list that the whole faculty read. And I I sent something to the faculty email list saying, you know, if your criterion is that we're gonna close anything that doesn't make a profit, then why is the library still open? Um, (laughs) Which which I thought made the point in a very graphic way, right? The result of that was the next day, there were seven emails from faculty all over campus complaining about these damned economists who wanna close the library. Uh, so I, at that point I gave up. So in your book, you summarize your approach to economics in four words, uh, people respond to incentives. And then you say the rest is commentary. Why is this so fundamental to your view? It's absolutely fundamental. I, um, you know, when the price of gas goes up, uh, uh, every time that happens, every time there's an interruption in the oil supply, the newspapers are full of articles explaining why this is not going to affect the amount of gasoline people buy, but it always affects the amount of gasoline people buy and buy a lot. Economists expect that, they know that, they even know how to estimate how big those effects are going to be. And yet people who are not economists to a remarkable degree just refuse to believe these well-documented effects. Uh, so it just, it, I feel like it needs to be said over and over again. Also, uh, the fact that people respond to incentives gives you a whole new way of understanding so many things. Uh, I'll, tell me if I go a little too far off topic here. Yeah, go for it. I'll, I'll interrupt you if, if it goes sure. astray too much. Um, at the end of every semester, and I'm sure this happens at every college, our students fill out evaluation forms saying how they liked the class, how they liked the professor. There is a lot of evidence, if you're a professor, as far as those evaluations go, it pays to be good looking. Um, Attractive professors get better evaluations everywhere at all times. It's very well documented effect. 
And there have been articles about this in the New Yorker, for example, where they keep saying that the explanation is that students are very shallow, students are very uh, superficial, they reward things that are not really relevant to the learning experience. I am convinced that's not it at all. If you think about incentives, then you understand what's happening. People who are very good looking have a lot of job opportunities that the rest of us don't have. They can be models, they can be movie stars, they can be, and, and more mundanely, they can uh, be successful in sales, in retail, where good looks pay off. Which means that a good looking teacher gave up a whole lot of opportunities to become a teacher. And a less good looking teacher gave up fewer opportunities. Now, by and large, somebody who gave up a lot of good opportunities to do something is somebody who is passionate about that thing. And somebody who's passionate about something is going to do a better job of it. So if you look at the, you know, when I explain this to my students, I tell them, you show me a lighthouse keeper with movie star good looks, and I will show you the world's greatest lighthouse keeper. Because if he gave up a career in Hollywood <laughs> to do this, he must love it. And the same is true of teachers, the same is true of everyone else. You would expect in an occupation where looks don't matter directly to your performance, you would generally expect the best looking people to do the best job. And so um, it's part of why I say the main thing you need to understand in economics is that people respond to incentives. If you think about this in terms of the incentives that the teachers were responding to when they chose a career, then it all makes sense. Yes, yeah, so I really enjoy these examples of where looking at kind of the full context of incentives helps explain a lot. And including you have examples of counterintuitive incomes. And one I really like that you talk about is the relationship between paper slash logging and number of trees versus recycling and number of trees. Could you talk about that one? Uh, sure. Um, look, where do trees come from? Uh, they come from a lot of places, but a lot of them come from the fact that people plant them. And the reason they plant them is because they're going to be profitable. They plant trees, in particular paper companies plant uh, enormous numbers of trees. If you use less paper, they will plant fewer trees and the world will have fewer trees. Uh, and this is, um, uh, this is not just a purely theoretical guess. There are, and I don't have them in front of me, but you might, um, I, I don't remember what I cited in the book. There are a number of state agencies that, uh, that regulate things like this, which have made the same point on their web pages that um, the world has more trees when people don't recycle paper than when people do. And uh, many people find that very hard to believe, but then I always say to those people, look, what if we found a way to recycle meat? Do you think there would be more or fewer cattle in the world? Uh, the reason people uh, raise cattle is that meat can only be used once. And so they're constantly raising more cattle. Somehow um, it's the exact same point and people have no trouble seeing that it's true if you give them a hypothetical example involving cattle and they find it very hard to believe when you give them a real world example involving paper and trees, but uh, it's the same point and it's a correct point. Yeah, I think that once you bring up the example of cattle, it's very hard to agree, very hard to argue with. I think part of it, and we'll discuss this later, is, is people put trees in this kind of magical, morally superior category of just things that exist in infinite quantities naturally versus things that we choose deliberately. Another thing about trees that I've been noticing is like if you were to name what is the biggest environmental hazard in the US, I would have to say it's the California forests right now. Uh, Can you I think of a bigger one? I can't think offhand of a bigger one. I would I would I I find it plausible. I don't know for sure, but what you're saying sounds plausible. Yeah, so it's, it's just an interesting thing where like if if human beings had created anything as destructive as the California forests are given their current mismanagement, it would be completely <laughs> illegal. Uh, I, I <laughs> certainly believe that too. <laughs> it's, a, it's an excellent point. <laughs> I'm thinking about that lately. Um, all right, let's talk about you. So when we emailed, you mentioned you had some thoughts about a very another very topical issue besides energy, which is, is vaccines. So tell us what you think about that, and then I'll chime in if I have anything to Well, add you know, we talked about people responding to incentives as the, as the key idea in economics, but there's one more really key idea, and that is you, that you cannot efficiently allocate a scarce valuable resource without using prices. And that's what they're trying to do with vaccines right now. Uh, I spent uh, a week 
in front of my computer, just clicking, clicking, clicking to try to find a place that had an open appointment. Uh, if I could have just paid uh, uh, some number of dollars to get that appointment to go to the front of the line, um, then all of that time that I wasted would not have been wasted. And the money that I paid could have been used by the government to do some good thing with. Um, they could have uh, given it to poor people to help them subsidize their purchases of vaccines or to use some other way if they preferred to use it some other way. One way or another, I was going to compete to get that vaccine appointment. If I compete by spending a lot of time, nobody gets the benefit of that time. If I compete by willing, being willing to pay a little bit more than somebody else, then that amount that I pay is available to do some good with. It is always better to allocate via prices than by making people waste time or waste some other resource. That's the small part of the story. The big part of the story is this. The world is full of people who look identical where one of them really needs the vaccine in a much bigger hurry than the other one. Imagine someone who lives to dance. That's all she wants to do is go out every night and dance. And there's somebody else, her twin sister, who looks exactly like her, but she loves to stay home and read. Well, the dancer should sh surely get the vaccine before the reader. It makes a difference in months and months of the quality of this person's life. Why should the reader not be allowed to, if she happens to get a, a good spot in line, why should she not be allowed to resell it to the dancer? Why shouldn't we have a market where people who have got one way or another, a place uh, near the front of the line, can sell it to somebody who needs it more? Or two managers in different businesses look identical on paper, but one of them finds that he or she is much more productive going into the office. The other one finds that a different management style, equally productive working from home. Um, it's important. It's important to the livelihoods of dozens, hundreds, thousands of people to get that uh, manager back into the office, the first one back into the office as fast as possible. If the second one happens to draw a, 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 a much sooner place in line, why can't they trade? Why can't that um, be sold to somebody who needs it more and who signals that they need it more by being willing to pay a little bit more for it? Uh, there are so many ways that prices could have made this process go much faster. And um, it's very frustrating to me that all economists understand that and we can't seem to explain it to anybody else. I mean, one thing I like about your analysis here, and this this occurs a lot in the Armchair Economist, and I think also in your, your particularly your essay about environmentalism, is recognizing that individuals have very different preferences and that life is multidimensional. And part of that is we have very different views toward things like risk of death, which is an ever present thing in life. And so this reminded me of the, just the general COVID situation where as far as I could tell, the standard being used by most public decision makers was uh, minimize death from this virus at all costs. And I'm curious how you took that focus as an, as an economist who's focused on these multidimensional things. I'm not sure exactly what they were maximizing, but your description sounds not too far from what I've observed. Uh, the right way to uh, make decisions about masks, lockdowns, whatever, is to not to try to minimize deaths at all costs, because nobody wants you to do that. If you were minimizing deaths at all costs across all walks of life, you would ban automobiles, uh, you, would, you would ban all construction projects, you would ban all mass transportation. Um, people are willing to risk death, to take small risks of death for all sorts of conveniences. And the right way to figure out what, uh, what COVID policy should be is to quantify that, to say, well, um, how much are people willing to sacrifice in order to avoid, say, a one-tenth of 1% 1 chance of death? We have good data on that. We know how much people are willing to pay for safety equipment in their cars. We know how much people are willing to pay for uh, safety equipment in at, at work. We know how much additional you have to pay a person in order to get them to take a slightly more risky job at work. So we've got a pretty good idea, in fact, that um, for, let me get this right, to avoid a one-tenth of 1% 1 chance of death, people view that as worth roughly $100,000, probably a little less. Um, 
which means that if you can uh, impose a policy that reduces everyone's chance of death by about one tenth of one percent, and it costs less than about one hundred thousand dollars a person, it's probably a good policy. If it costs more than one hundred thousand dollars a person, it's probably a bad policy. And I do not know how much of that kind of analysis went into this COVID stuff. Uh, many of the government agencies, many of the regulatory agencies actually um, do a pretty good job of accounting for things like this. But I don't know that it went into the COVID planning. Um, perhaps it did in a way that was invisible to me. Uh, it looks to me like a lot of these um, uh, lockdowns and so on, uh, not all of them, but some of them went farther than they ought to have on that basis. And again, I think part of it is that just that people are not used to thinking about economics. And in particular, they're not used to thinking about the fact that different people have different preferences, as you said. Uh, on the other hand, there are broad patterns in those preferences that we're able to identify and um, that we ought to be guided by what people want, not by what we think they ought to want. All right. Well, I raised a, a big topic there, but uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But let's, I want to really talk about this essay, which I, I love. So why I'm not an environmentalist. So first, we're going to go into a bunch of the details of it, but what brought about this uh, essay? And I'm in particular wondering if you thought it would cause a lot of controversy when you added it to this, uh, to this book, because it's, I would say the book has a lot of unconventional ideas, but this is definitely the most controversial thing in that book. Yeah, I did. I was warned not to include it in the book and to publish it elsewhere because it um, uh, might have turned off some readers who would then be turned off to the other messages in the book that they otherwise might have benefited from. But I, I felt like I wanted it there. I, it really is an application of the main ideas of economics that I want people to understand. It doesn't say you should not care about the environment. It doesn't say you should not care about particles in the atmosphere. It says you're allowed to care about anything you wanna care about. And some people will care about some things more than other people do. And, um, uh, if, if you wanna build a parking lot that's going to destroy a beautiful forest, um, some people are going to prefer the forest and some people are going to prefer the parking lot. There's no moral issue there. There is a conflict and there's a conflict that has to be resolved. And when we have conflicts and we resolve conflicts, some people are going to walk away unhappy. But that doesn't mean that there was a right and a wrong. It means that, that different people want different things and we live in a world where we have to deal with that. Um, so why do you call it the religion? I mean, I, I definitely, I'll just have my cards on the table. I definitely regard modern environmentalism as a religion from a philosophy perspective, but why do you call it the religion of ecology versus the science of economics? Uh, well, I want to make clear there certainly is a science of ecology and there certainly is a science of, uh, environmental decision-making and there is a science of, um, uh, figuring out, uh, how to weigh one set of costs and benefits against another. And in that science, we do want to account for the fact that people love clean air and they love beautiful forests and they love all those things. We, we, I, I'm not dismissing any of that. But ecology becomes a religion when people violate the principle that I just, that I just mentioned. They, they insist that there is a right and a wrong about what people ought to care about. Uh, they insist that the person who prefers being able to park closer to the building is somehow morally inferior to the person who prefers to have uh, 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 cleaner air or the person who prefers to have um, a more pristine uh, forest or garden or meadow. Uh, I, I think that I use the word religion to mean in this context, the association of moral values with things that are really just preferences. And um, this is the, that's, that's why I use the word. I mean, an interesting thing though is, is I think their view is that preferences should, human preferences should not count because wilderness has a right to exist for its own sake. And I just wanna contrast this to your view. So, in the intro, in the in the newer version of the book, I think the 2012 version, you have an intro to the essay, and you say something I totally agree with, but I think is unusual. You say this: the first part isn't unusual, but you say, like you, I care about the quality of my environment. I prefer my air and water to be clean and my physical surroundings to be beautiful. I also prefer my computer to be fast, my car to be comfortable, and my shower spray to be strong. All of those things are part of my environment. 
So you're definitely taking, you're looking at environment from a human perspective. That is like everything is the human environment. I agree with this totally, but I think their perspective is the environment means non-human nature and it, it's, it has a moral right to be undisturbed by us. And so their view is our preferences don't matter. What, so yeah, what do I mean, I, I, I tend to feel like moral rights accrue to entities that are capable of feeling, uh, Moral rights accrue to entities that that uh, the wilderness does not care if you destroy it. It does does not have the the uh, machinery, the mental machinery that we have that would make it care. Uh, I I think when we are making policy, we should take account of the feelings of entities that actually care what the results of our policies are. And uh, forests are not. It would be a very religious position, I think, to say that the forest is aware of what's happening to it. Um, I, I don't feel bad about uh, cutting a slice of bread in half because I'm pretty sure the slice of bread doesn't feel it. Uh, and I don't feel bad about cutting down a forest because I'm pretty sure, now I, there are forests I would prefer not to see cut down, but I don't feel bad about cutting them down in the same sense that I don't feel bad about cutting a slice of bread in half. It's, it's, it's a forest, it doesn't feel anything. Uh, I do feel bad about the fact that some people will miss that forest, and I think we ought to account for their feelings when we're deciding what to do. But I also feel bad if you don't cut down the forest uh, about the people who would have preferred to use that land for something else. Um, I, and again, that that creates a lot of difficult political problems that we have to figure out how to solve. Thankfully, we live in a time and a place where, for the most part, people have bought into the idea that we ought to be able to solve conflicts without killing each other. Um, but I think we also ought to put aside the instinct to, uh, uh, I've lost the verb I'm looking for, but the instinct to disparage people's, uh, morals just because they happen to disagree with, with what we like. Gotcha. Uh, I found in your essay, you have a very interesting approach to species extinction, where you talk about a certain monkey and then a lion. Could you talk about that? Uh, you know, species extinction is like everything else. There, there are costs to keeping species alive. Uh, it, uh, I, I don't have uh, detailed examples at my fingertips, but it's, it's easy to imagine that there is some creature that lives in a certain kind of forest. And if you start logging in that forest, or if you build houses in that forest, or if you put dams in the rivers in that forest, that creature might not survive. Well, uh, some people really care whether that creature survives. I, I suspect, I don't know this, but I suspect a lot of those people exaggerate for effect the extent to which they care. Uh, I expect a lot of those people, if you ask them, would you be willing to pay $1,000 to keep these species from going extinct? A lot of them would suddenly say, no, I don't actually care that much. Um, but um, people say they care. Uh, other people say that they really care about having uh, the wood from the logging or having the power from the damming or having the uh, being able to build a house there or, or goodness knows what else. Uh, it seems to me that all those preferences are morally on the same level. We need to find a way to reconcile them. It is true that the person who wants to log there, I think we can usually trust them to be telling the truth because they're putting their own money behind the uh, project. The person who says, I wanna build a house there, we can trust them to be telling the truth because they're gonna put their money behind it. The people who say, I really, really care about whether that species gets wiped out, I'm a little skeptical of how seriously we should take them, but that doesn't mean we should dismiss them entirely. And I think you know we need to think about that. We need to figure out whether there are ways to determine how much they really care. And uh, once we believe we know how much they really care, we ought to account for that, uh, but they don't automatically win just because they're on the side of the of the of the uh, creature. Why not just have property rights and then they can pay to preserve it? Yeah. Now you know there are, and things like the Nature Conservancy does a very good job of that. Uh, I, I assume you're familiar with the Nature Conservancy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if all your listeners are, but they uh, preserve forests and rivers and, and other um, ecological niches by identifying ones that they think are very important to preserve and then buying them. And they do that with funds that are contributed to them. They act as a charity. Uh, I have no objection to any of that. 
Um, there are problems, you know, that economists are well aware of uh, with free riding. Uh, it may be that there are a thousand people who really, really care about that location, but only a hundred of them are willing to contribute because everybody's saying, uh, I bet other people are going to contribute, therefore I don't have to. And so you don't always get the perfect outcomes that way. But, um, you know, economists have also been very clever about designing mechanisms that give people the right incentives to reveal their preferences. Um, uh, we, um, we have mechanisms, for example, uh, I, I can't do this in too much detail without a blackboard, but I'll give the 20 second version, where you can pledge to give a certain amount to, um, to buying up this wilderness area. And we only actually enforce the pledge if your money was needed to make a difference. Uh, if after we've looked at all the other pledges, if we see that your pledge wouldn't have made a difference anyway, then we don't charge you. We only charge you if it makes a difference. That gives you an incentive to pledge only if, uh, only if you really care and to be assured that if other people's pledges are gonna do the job without you, then, then uh, you have gotten your opportunity to free ride and, and you haven't passed that up. So there, there are ways to deal with these things. Um, to make the mechanism I just spoke with work perfectly, again, there are details that I would need a Blackboard to explain and I don't think your viewers are in the mood for that right now. But we do have ways of solving those things. And I think if they were implemented more, people would get used to them and they would, uh, uh, and we would be very close to an ideal solution to a lot of these things. I don't know if you've studied this one, but an interesting incentive one is hunting and certain kinds of animals. Like I've heard different, you know, advocate, I'm not a hunter myself, but I've heard you know, advocates of hunting say, hey, this is like, this is the way to preserve certain exotic species. Like if you allow hunting of them, then these hunters will pay large amounts of money to go preserve them versus if you don't, they'll just be a nuisance to their laborers who are trying to survive. And the, so have you ever, are you familiar with this line of argument? I have heard that argument. I have not investigated how true it is. It sounds plausible to me. Uh, it's just an interesting one where there's people have such moral outrage about the hunting that they wouldn't even consider it. That's kind of why I find it. Yeah. And again, I think it, it, it um, I think there's an element of religion in that. So, Tell the story about your daughter, because this is this is the story that begins the essay about your daughter's, I believe, is a preschool graduation. And you, you wrote a very, uh, I found it entertaining letter to the preschool teacher. Yeah, I, 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 I would like that letter to be more widely read. And I think, uh, you know, if people uh, track down the essay, uh, why I'm not an environmentalist, I, I, I hope that they read at least as far as that letter. Uh, you know, my daughter graduating from preschool was part of a ceremony where they recited all these platitudes about how they were going to, um, you know, you've probably read this more, more recently than I have, you probably, <laughs> probably. You recall it better than I do, but all sorts of platitudes about um, uh, respecting the environment. Uh, uh, oh, I think the phrase was something like... Um, you may have it in front of you, uh, some about got, responsibilities. Uh, go ahead and yeah, read it if you can. There's a lot. I'll, I'll pull it up. Uh, if you talk about it just for a few seconds, I'll pull it up. Sure. It, yes. it was about the responsibilities that they have as stewards of the environment. Um, and um, it all seemed very much to be emphasizing one small subset of the things that they are stewards of, one small subset of the set of things that people in the world care about that uh, they ought to care about too. I remember they were being told to wash out their cups and reuse them every time they used a cup uh, in order to save on um, uh, paper because the cups were made out of paper. Uh, completely ignored the fact that in order to save a lot of paper, they were using up a lot of time and time is a resource as valuable as paper is, sometimes more valuable, sometimes less, but they were being discouraged, actively discouraged from thinking about the fact that everything is full of trade-offs. And if you preserve more of one thing, you're gonna be preserving less of another. They were basically being told quite arbitrarily that these are the things you should care about using up. And these are the things you should not care about using up. And I, 
I wrote what I thought was, and I'm glad you confirmed it, a pretty amusing letter to the teacher about this, to which I got no response. Oh, no. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. So just to quote from the essay, the recurring mantra was with privilege comes responsibility. And yeah, it's interesting you mention in particular in the letter, I think is a very revealing example and, and captures the religion of this, the recycling. And, you know, because your letter, you're very, you know, you you draw this parallel between, so you talk about your family being Jewish, you draw this parallel between, uh, you know, if you, when you, I think your daughter was at a school or someone was at a school where they, they sort of forced Christianity down their throats and you objected to this and, and then the teachers got it and they stopped doing it. And you were saying, well, forcing environmentalism, including this idea that everyone should recycle everything is the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I, th I think I had that right then. I think, uh, I, I don't think I would want to change a word of what I said there. Um, yeah, I, I have no idea what the teacher made of it, but again, it, it did not inspire a response. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's uh, just, yeah, I'm going to I highly recommend that in particular. I mean, this, this, I'll just read one of my favorite parts of it. Uh, we are not environmentalists. We ardently oppose environmentalists. We consider environmentalism a form of mass hysteria akin to Islamic fundamentalism or the war on drugs. We do not recycle. We teach our daughter not to recycle. We teach her that people who try to convince her to recycle or who try to force her to recycle are intruding on her rights. Like, I enjoyed that so much. Good. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm impressed. I guess you have tenure, right? Did you have tenure when you published this? Did I have tenure when I published that? I have no idea. I, I, it's a long time ago. I, I don't remember the timeline. Today, it would seem like a fatal risk to tenure, maybe, if to say that about recycling. I don't know. I am... Um, Things have gotten pretty weird in academia. I'm not sure how weird they've gotten. Uh, so let, let me ask about something that you don't cover in this, and I'm curious on your views about to the extent you've studied it, which is the modern climate catastrophe movement. So the idea that you know burning fossil fuels is causing an existential crisis that's going to kill us all in 12 to 30 years. Uh, I am not an expert on this, so I'm, I'm speaking here as an amateur. But... And maybe I'm completely wrong, but I think I'm right. Uh, they talk about how there are all these multiple models that all give very similar results. And sometimes you will read things that say, well, sure, you might feel like you can't trust one particular scientific model. But uh, when you have all these different models that are all giving you the same broad picture of what things are going to look like, that should give you a reason to, to have faith. As far as I can tell, all of what they're calling different models are all models of atmospheric turbulence. And there is only one model of atmospheric turbulence, and that is what are called the Navier-Stokes equations. And the Navier-Stokes equations are extremely difficult to solve. So nobody can solve them. All you can do is approximate solutions. And different people have chosen different methods of approximating the solutions to these equations. But they're the same equations. They're not different models. They're different approximations to the solution of basically the same model. Um, I, I don't think there is an alternative model. I think that's all we got. Um, so I'm, I, I, whenever I hear people say, oh, there are all these completely different models that lead to the same place, I'm pretty sure they're wrong. Um, uh, and again, I. I generally object to people on podcasts mouthing off about stuff that they're not 100% sure of. Uh, here I am doing it. Maybe you have a listener who can set me straight, but I'm, I'm pretty sure of this. Well, yeah, you, you qualified it, which is very uh, unusual. But I, I would say that, you know, I mean, I think there's a couple of things with the models. But one thing is, if you look at how the models are done, it's actually that they have hugely divergent results that they average. But if you just look at the, you know, the outcomes of it, like even if you look at the, what the UN says is the range of what they call the climate sensitivity to CO2. So if you double CO2, how much does it warm? It's 1.5 degrees Celsius to 4.5 degrees Celsius. Like that's an enormous range. If you think it's been one degree Celsius in the last 150 years or so. So there, I, I, it, what you say is probably true. I'm not, I'm going to look into that. But it's also true that like the, the range of the, they acknowledge actually that they can't make meaningful 
predictions. My, my own focus on it is that I don't think people account enough for uh, our ability to master just about any climate conditions. So I don't think there, any- there, I'm sure you're right there. I'm sure you're right. Um, uh, the people respond to incentives and, and when, when, uh, as it becomes, here's a great example. Here's a great example. The Rolling Stone magazine recently had an article about how if the oceans rise a little bit, New York City is going to become unlivable. We're going to have to move all of New York City 30 miles inland, and they estimate how expensive that's going to be. And they say, look, this is just, and they come up with some phenomenal number. Okay, and this was, this was a featured article in Rolling Stone about how incredibly expensive it's going to be just to move this one city if the oceans rise a little bit. What they completely overlook is that over the next hundred years, we are going to rebuild New York City from scratch anyway, because there are no buildings, very few buildings that are gonna last another hundred years anyway. If the oceans appear to be rising, then one by one, as those buildings are decommissioned, people are gonna build substitutes for them further inland. Building substitutes further inland is not a lot more expensive than building them in the spot where they already are. So the city will naturally move as people respond to incentives, as they get more information, as it looks like the oceans are rising, as it, it, which might or might not happen, but if it does, as it looks like Manhattan's going to become uh, uninhabitable, people will gradually move the city to a different location. And it will not be incredibly costly because they were going to have to rebuild it anyway. Um, uh, to what Rolling Stone essentially did was looked at the comparison between what happens if we have to move New York and what happens in some fantasy world where every building in New York suddenly acquires an infinite lifespan. Um, it, it's, it's a ridiculous kind of comparison and you see this kind of thing all the time. People respond to incentives and environmental catastrophe, even if it happens, whatever it means, is not gonna happen all at once. We're going to see it coming. And as we see it coming, people will move, people will plant different crops, people will go to different locations. Uh, 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 people will uh, certainly be incentivized to find whole new technologies we cannot even currently imagine. And I believe that will happen because it always happens when the world faces any kind of crisis. But even if you think that that's pie in the sky, you don't need fancy new technology. All you need is people to move to new places. All you need is, is, is different crops to be planted or the same crops to be planted in different places. People will do that. They're not stupid. So this just seems to be almost the most elementary kind of economic application of economics. Again, people respond to incentives. If the water is higher, they'll respond. And if, I mean, the, you know, a fact that I like about water levels is 100 million people in the world already live below sea level. Like they, you have ways of dealing with it, even without moving, let alone moving. Why do you think, so the profession of economics knows so much about human adaptation. And we have the past hundred years where we've adapted to climate to such a level where the death rate from climate has gone down by a factor of 50. Why does economic, why do economists not talk more publicly about our ability to adapt, which would reassure people who are terrified that the human race is going to go extinct? I think that, um, you know, many economists have tried. Uh, people are remarkably um, resistant to these simple ideas, these simple, well-proven ideas. Um, I recently had a very frustrating conversation with a prominent economist who has been advising state governments on how to allocate vaccines. And as we said at the beginning of our, our process, you cannot efficiently allocate vaccines without prices. I'm gonna get a vaccine, you're gonna get a vaccine three months later when you needed it desperately right away and I didn't mind staying home for another three months and that's gonna ruin three months of your life. He's been advising state governments on how to allocate vaccines without using prices at all. And I said to him, "What? Isn't it your job to teach them some economics, to tell them that this is the only mechanism we have to allocate a resource efficiently. And he said, as soon as I say the word prices, they're not gonna to listen to another word I say. So I'm, I'm giving them methods that are 
10% as good as using prices, but still better than what they would do without me. And that's what I view my job as. And, um, you know, if it were me, I would tell them the truth, but maybe he's right. He says you would do no good at all because as soon as you say the word price, they shut down completely. So how does that relate to the climate? Uh, you know, there are certain things that cause people to shut down completely. Uh, for reason, if you say the word price, people shut down completely. If you say, um, uh, if you say that people are good at adapting, they seem to shut down completely. If you say that technology always advances, they seem to shut down completely. There are certain things they just, where a remarkable number of minds are very closed. I'm guessing you followed the saga because uh, you mentioned Freakonomics in your book of, of Super Freakonomics, where Levitt yeah. talked about geoengineering and was just assaulted. I mean, I have no idea whether the, the systems he talked about are going to work or not, but my goodness, to propose them or it, to propose that we think about them, that was what he was pilloried for, was proposing that we think about whether or not these geoengineering uh, solutions might work. Uh, it's just crazy. Of course, we should be thinking about everything that, I mean, thinking is not that expensive and thinking is fun too. So why not think about uh, every, every idea that comes along? Yes. Yeah, so to me, it just comes down to this idea that it's a religion. Like people just think there's something wrong with impacting the climate. And then there's this kind of mythology that it's all a delicate balance and it's going to be disrupted and then everything is going to come crashing down. Uh, but, and, but part of that is it's just not rec I mean, the religious part is partially like we're helpless because we're going to offend the God of nature and it's going to punish us. Whereas in reality, we deal with every imaginable climate condition already. And the amounts of change people are talking about are pretty insignificant compared to all the other stuff we're going to have to adapt to in the next 50 or hundred years. But, you know, you just triggered something when you use the phrase delicate balance, it occurs to me that Another thing which is a delicate balance is the economy where we have um, millions and millions of people interacting and all their preferences have to be accounted for and all their abilities and skills have to be accounted for. And we have this amazingly intricate system where everything interacts with everything else. And uh, there are laws of economics that govern the way that works out just as there are laws of biology that, that govern the way the environment works out. And yet it seems to me by and large that those people who are most concerned about the delicate balance in nature and say, we cannot do anything to interfere with that because it's all so delicate. We don't know what, whatever we do, the results could cascade and cascade and who knows what will happen. These are often the same people who are most enthusiastic about regulating the economy, uh, tossing monkey wrenches into the way the economy works, uh, mandating things from on high uh, that will once again, threaten a delicate balance in a way that will cascade and have all sorts of unforeseen consequences. It's odd that the same people so often are so concerned about one delicate balance and so unconcerned about the other. That suggests to me that maybe they're not thinking all that carefully. And I just say the, the, the part of the delicate balance I'm most interested in professionally is the energy part of it. And you just think of, this is what powers all the machines. And the only reason we can produce anywhere near as much as we produce is that the machines are producing so much value for us. And yet there's little, you know, when they talk about transitioning, there's all sorts of things you can say about, there's no evidence at all that any of these so-called transitions can work cost effectively. But even if they could, uh, and even if the government could do it, you'd at least expect some concern about what if we mismanage it? What if it goes wrong? What if we have mass power outages like they had in Texas? And there's just no interest in that delicate balance, even though, I mean, what's a more delicate balance than the electric grid, which has to match supply and demand constantly to keep life as we know it going? Yeah, That's, great example. Yeah, but I, I love the point about the, the economy uh, more broadly. Well, Steve, thanks so much for coming on the show. Where can listeners learn more about you and your work? Uh, first of all, they can go to my blog, which is at thebigquestions.com, all one word, thebigquestions.com. Um, from there, they'll find links to uh, some of my books. Uh, my most recent book is called Can You Outsmart an Economist? And they can read about that direct, and they can read a free chapter from that at outsmartaneconomist.com, uh, all one word, outsmartaneconomist.com. So those two sites, outsmartaneconomist.com and thebigquestions.com. Great. And what are you working on in the future? 
Uh, you know, I've got, I'm not sure I'm ready to talk about them yet, but I, some, I have made the mistake of, of uh, trying to write four books at once. And so I'm, I'm, I'm working on all of them, each of them about a quarter of my time. And, and uh, if you have me back a year from now, I'll be ready to talk about some of those. Okay. That sounds wise not to talk about it. I, I made, I was going to do an update of my first book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, which I thought would take mm-hmm. two months. And then it ended up being a totally new book that took over two years. And I regret announcing all of my future plans incorrectly 10 times. You know, so. John Maynard Keynes once said that if people had any idea how hard it is to start a business, no businesses would ever get started. And I suspect the same thing is true about writing books. <laughs> and yet we do it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, Steve, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, sure. Sure. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Stephen Landsberg for joining me. Uh, Stephen reminds me of, uh, the, I meet this kind of person, a certain kind of person less frequently than I would like, but when I meet them, I just think this is normal. This is what a normal person who's not totally messed up by this whole anti-human impact movement, AKA environmentalist movement. I think anti-human impact is more accurate. Like I'll give you an example. I, I met one of the, like, I don't want to give away the name, but like a, one of the world's leading scientists, let's just say that. And I was talking to him about my views and I expected, oh, he's going to give me this strong protest. And we were talking about mastery of climate slash adaptation to climate. And he just was like, yeah, of course. Like, yeah, if sea levels rise, we can build levees. We know how to do this. And he was just totally unconcerned about hypothetical you know, changes in climate conditions. It just didn't register on his radar. And then I mentioned, I met another guy who was a high level executive at a bank. I happened to meet him on a plane. And he's like, yeah, you know, we're human beings are just very sophisticated beavers. Whatever happens, we'll adapt. And this is really, and I have a good friend of mine. We were just talking about this, uh, no, talking about this several years ago. And he's just like, yeah, well, we should already be trying to engineer the climate and make certain places better. And it just occurs to me that when you, when you aren't messed up by this anti-human thinking where you have this idea that it's wrong for us to impact things and that nature is a delicate nurturer that's going to be uh, destroyed if we impact it. Like if you lack that, you can just be, have a much more realistic view of the world because you can see that human beings uh, generally make the world a much better place in terms of we intelligently impact the world. And it's needed for us to do there's a need for us to do a lot more of it. So I just, I like, one thing I liked about Stephen Landsberg, Landsberg's essay is, and, and you know, which is the end of the book, which you should get, The Armchair Economist, is it just, he has such a naturally pro-human way of looking at things and it's unapologetic and it's it's rare, but I would say it's normal. This is the normal healthy thing. This was the way of thinking for most of human history, at least a lot of recent history, when we actually lived much nearer to nature and couldn't have this godlike mythology about nature. And I, it's an attitude I would like to spread. So I'm really glad that he has this pro-human attitude, and I'm always on the lookout for others who have it. All right, that is it for this week. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, email me at alex at alexepstein.com. To see the latest truths about energy, follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Alex Epstein and or go to energytalkingpoints.com where I have lots of new content posted. One note I I forgot about, speaking of energytalkingpoints.com, there's a big story from NBC News last week about energy talking points. Then I saw something from what's called Texas Tribune, which is a smaller outlet, but still pretty significant about energy talking points. And people are talking about how I've influenced different elected officials and the implication is, oh, I'm influencing them in some way that's negative. But as you'll see from the articles, they can't refute a thing that I've said because what I've said is true, which is that, which is not that solar panels and wind turbines somehow by themselves caused the Texas crisis, but rather pro-solar and wind policies caused the crisis by defunding reliable, and this is key, and resilient uh, power plants and infrastructure. So at a very popular Twitter thread that reached over 2 million people. And probably more than that, if you look at all the tweets, like many of which had hundreds of thousands uh, on their own, and the lead tweet had over 2 million. Uh, So if you check that out, uh, the core content of that is at energytalkingpoints.com on the Texas electricity crisis section of it. I think you'll just see nobody has an answer to this. So 
it's I'm really glad I'm getting the coverage and I'm really glad they haven't really been able to say anything. These are they they're sort of designed like hit pieces, but they never even say anything bad about me. Uh, and there's nothing bad to say about the group because I offer this to elected officials as a free service. I'm not a lobbyist. I don't have any influence over them, except if they think what I'm saying is true and effective. So I'm glad more and more people think it's true and effective. If you know of any elected officials uh, at you know, the U.S. House, U.S. Senate, or governor's offices who want to be part of the Energy Talking Points group, tell them to email me at alex at alexepstein.com. Also, if you want to support more of the projects that make energytalkingpoints.com possible, uh, if you want to support our research and development efforts, our promotional efforts, go to industrialprogress.com slash accelerate and become an accelerator. Next, Excel, we have bi-monthly accelerator meetings. The next one will be in May. There will be lots to talk about as my book should be finished or at least be very, very, very near finished editing. I'm in heavy editing mode right now. I'm about to go back to that after this. So let's wrap it up. I'll be back next week with another great guest. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.